you're managing a hundred grand worth of rents a month, you know, you're going to make six to 10 grand a month. We are pulling in, I think it's like 10,000 right now, but we just had this crazy bump in rents for our student housing portfolio. So my property manager said we'll be pulling in about 15,000 per month. What made you go from being the landlord to being the manager? You know, all right, Chris, so you went from building a $40 million portfolio to now going all in on property management. What made you go from being the landlord to being the manager? You know, one thing I can say about multifamily investing, ADU flipping, whatever you're doing, um, it's that the NOI, net operating income, dictates the value of these properties. And so when I realized that I could uh, save a dollar on an expense, what that would do to the valuation at a five cap, I was like, this is a no brainer. Why would I not manage my own properties very well? Um, what ended up happening was we had the best leasing agents, the best contractors, the best handyman. And we said, let's go all in on this and build a management company. And so others start bringing us their properties. And now we're trying to scale this thing out in San Diego. Yeah. So you guys got 50 properties under management now. Yep. And the goals, I assume, to have hundreds and then thousands and yep. all of that. But, you know, the one the reason I wanted to have you on is because I actually have never had a property manager on. And the more I think about it, the more I'm like, dude, this is such a great business model. I mean, it's recurring revenue. It's consistent. You know, your expenses aren't that crazy. Um, and, you know, once you get one investor, he's going to just keep bringing you more and more deals to manage. So, like, you know, you don't really even need that many clients to really start to build out a big operation. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool to see. I mean, it's all word of mouth. I can do one little post, that's the power of social media, and say, hey, I got my broker's license. I can manage your property. We have social media and presence, and people are attracted to that. They want to be part of that. So we, we created a company, Backyard Brokerage Inc., and that's the, the management arm for a lot of my students' properties and my own personal portfolio. Yeah. Continue to grow. So let's talk about how important property management is. So you know, you mentioned first off NOI. Okay. So for those who don't know, that's net operating income. And you mentioned a five cap, which a lot of people don't even know what you're talking about. So explain like what a five cap is and why saving $1 increases the value. Yeah. So a five cap is if you paid all cash for a property and there was no loan on it, um, that would be what you take home. And 5%. so- 5%. Yeah, 5%. And so 5% on 100K, you take home $5,000. Now, the reason why the NOI is so important is it has almost like this multiplier effect depending on the cap rate. So if we're in Vegas, the cap rate's maybe six, seven. San Diego, where I buy, you know, four and a half, five cap, it's going to be different. And so every dollar the property manager saves you, instead of going with Jose um, to, to fix this, whatever, fence for a hundred bucks, if we can get it done for 25 bucks and save that $75, that $75 divided by 0.05 yep. or whatever market we're in, um, that's going to give you the extra value if you exited that property to the new investor. Yeah. And so it is just insane how one, like how the decisions the property manager makes are super important. Yeah. So like to break it down for people, um, let's just say a property makes a hundred grand a year. That's mm -hmm. the net operating income. So if you're operating at a five cap, that means that you're going to take 100,000, divide it by 0 0.05, which I think would be $20 million, right? Or no, $2 million, sorry, not $20 million. <laughs> Let me bust <laughs> a, a million dollars would yeah. be, uh, you know. What was the NOI? NOI would be, what did I say? $100,000 $100, divided by yep. 0 0.05. Should be $2 million. Bucks. Two, $2 million bucks in valuation yeah. right there that the new investor would pay. That's yeah. the money. So basically, a new investor is going to pay $2 million bucks because yeah. they're going to make a hundred thousand a year on it. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, they could get loans and all that other stuff too. But overall, you know, they would net a hundred thousand dollars on the property. Yeah. So your point is, if you can get it to net, say one fifty, right? Because all of a sudden you're just better at renting it. Mm -hmm. You're better at keeping your expenses down, getting rents higher, getting vacancy down, and like all these different factors that influence NOI. Then all of a sudden, it's just worth way more. Absolutely. And then on top of that, if interest rates come back down and they compress, maybe things are trading Pacific Beach where I buy. Yeah. I was going in at three and a half cap. So say some new investor wants to buy from me at a three and a half cap. Mm -hmm. That just, this thing explodes now. You know, 150K divided yeah. by 0.035. I don't know what that is. It's a lot. Well, I was just saying 150K, I was doing the math, divided by 0.05. 
is three million. So by literally adding fifty k of NOI, it would be now worth three million. Yeah. Versus two million. Yeah. So like the management and and what you choose to do makes a huge difference. Exactly. So how are you guys? Like, let's just talk about these different factors, right? Because you guys got 50 properties under management now, uh, or 50 units, I should say. So, like, what does a good property manager do? So, for people that are looking to hire somebody like you or whoever else. Yeah, I think a good property manager is very transparent. Uh, someone who will share that the plumbing went bad and it's going to be 5000 or the disposal went bad. You want to know about a lot of this stuff. Uh, because as an investor, like transparency is all they ever want, right? And so we're transparent. We have we use Appfolio. We just switched from Buildium. Buildium yep. we used for five years. It's been great. Appfolio is kind of like the upgrade, and that's a the new software we're using. So we're able to do invoices there, pay our owners. Everything's seamless. Yeah. So from collecting rents to maintenance requests, uh, maintenance requests and taking care of the tenant is huge. Instead of Having a tenant live there for one year, they move out, you have vacancy, all these new costs, turnover. Having a tenant stay for one year, two years, three years, that's where it's at. That's where the money's made because you your NOI stays consistent and just goes up with the bump in rent. Yeah, you don't ever have the vacancy cost and it's everything. Huge. So yeah, let's talk about that, right? So if we're trying to increase NOI, first thing that you can do is not have it vacant. <laughs> yeah. So like first step is you got to rent it out. Yep. Right? So... What's your thoughts on like rental rates? Like, are you trying to max them out? And, you know, cause like on one hand, if you have them super high, like great, you might get a rent out, but it might be vacant for months. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're actually in the hole. Yeah. So how are you with pricing? That's, that's a great uh, question. Uh, investor yesterday, he reached out to me. He's got 30 units by San Diego state, which is where a lot of our management properties are. He said, I don't go for home runs. I go for nice base hits, consistent. I don't bump the rents too high. I just want nice steady rent across the portfolio. And then I try to pitch him on me managing his portfolio. He's not quite <laughs> He's not ready. I was like, I hit home runs. Come on. Like, yeah. Let me manage. So, well, okay. But let's just get some doubles. We'll get you some doubles. The doubles, yeah. Yeah. But so I've always been a manager since 2016. And when I entered into the student housing game by San Diego State, we were getting like nine fifty a thousand a bedroom. And right. there's like 10 bedrooms between a house and an ADU. So every year I was pushed it. I was like 1200, 1300. We just hit like 1500 per bedroom this last school semester. And we do that because we have the best properties located across from San Diego State, or I have units across the street from the ocean, you know, three blocks yeah. from the ocean. So I just buy in great locations and I advise my investors too, so I can really push those rents every lease. So will cycle. you manage bedrooms too, like student housing that way? We lease it as a master lease for say maybe a five bedroom, three bath home. And um, the tenants are joint and severable with the co-signing parents. Um, but we don't lease per bedroom. We usually give them an average, hey, it's going to be 1500 per bedroom. You can figure out the rent yourself. We'll give them like the total number. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're just trying, you're not trying to go crazy with rents, but you want to obviously, you know, find that happy yeah. middle ground, right? What I will say is with the student housing game, a lot of students, they're going to be there regardless for 11 and a half months. Sometimes they don't want to go home to mom and dad for the summer. They stay there. So we do 12 month leases. and our They really do 12 months? I thought that was like a nine month deal. Yeah. By San Diego State, we do 12 month leases mm. um, for the properties on campus. But if it's by the beach, I like to do nine months student housing. The other three months, I do Airbnb to oh. maximize the summer. It's a way to maximize. So you don't even want them to stay for 12 months. No, I'm like, take a nine-month lease, <laughs> dip out, see you later. <laughs> We're going to go kill it on the beach. Yeah, exactly. Because then we play the Airbnb game, mm. which is just crazy in San Diego. Yeah, so like from a rental rate maximization, it sounds like you're not doing it the way a normal property manager would do it, where they're like one exit strategy of like, hey, you know, we just do 12 month leases with people. Or, you know, I do have people who do like Airbnb and that's like, all I do is Airbnb management. You're saying you guys do a blend? Yeah, we're doing a blend and we will get more into Airbnbs because what I realized is I own these properties and tenants were leasing from me and doing Airbnb arbitrage, which I was okay with because I just like that steady rent. But then I start seeing what these guys hey, are making. home. I'm like, I want, I want in on that. Let me in. Yeah. So when their leases end, we'll either collaborate. Maybe I'll start an Airbnb arm of the property management company that's more like vacation rentals. Yeah. And I'm gonna lean into this management company thing. You think of Graystar, like these these big management companies, like they are raking in the dough. 
yeah. RPM. Um, and that's what I'm passionate about. So, Inflation is crazy. Right now, $3 won't even get you a gallon of gas or a cup of coffee. But the good news is it'll get you my wholesaling blueprint and a trial to Wealthy University. You might be wondering, Ryan, what are those? Well, Wealthy University is our online community where you're going to be able to network with six, seven, and eight-figure real estate investors and entrepreneurs. We have live calls every single week. You can come and ask me questions directly every single Tuesday, and you have access to all of our courses, all the recordings of WealthCon, and exclusive events. Along with that, you're also going to get our Wholesalers Blueprint, which is going to give you all the scripts we use when we talk to sellers, all the contracts that we've used to lock up hundreds of deals, and you'll even get my Contractor's Guide, which gives you all of the materials we use in our house flips. And if that wasn't enough, I'm also going to give you a copy of my two books, The Wealthy Way and Flip Your Future. All that will be yours for just $3 by going to Wealthy University. University.com. There is no better deal for $3, especially when inflation's on the rise. So instead of maybe getting half a cup of coffee, go to WealthyUniversity.com and go get the Wholesaler's Blueprint and your trial today. Yeah. I, I mean, the more I think about it, right, as a real estate investor, and a lot of people listen to the show are real estate investors or they're investors who are um, lending money, you know, they're private money lenders, whatever. Um, we always think about it from the ownership perspective as ways to generate cash flow and income. And the property management side is so lucrative. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to um, the girl who's been managing my Airbnb now for like the last six years. Mm -hmm. I've been doing Airbnb a long time. Yeah. And like, dude, I, I hit her up the other day and she was like, yeah, dude, it's like I've, because at first she had no property management experience, yeah. but she was really good. Like I just knew she was detail, everything. So I was like, hey, you know, I'll show you how to manage my Airbnb. You'll be great at it. You could do it remote. Here's what I'll pay you. Boom, boom, boom. Right. And she did great. She was amazing. She took over my portfolio. It was a good side income for her because she was just a stay at home mom. Mm -hmm. So it was a great side income. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then recently I talked to her and she's like, yeah, I have like over 50 properties now that we manage. We travel everywhere. We do it remote. I'm making multiple six figures. That's amazing. And I was like, wow. Like this thing really changed your family's life. Like that's crazy. Yeah. And I never hear about anybody really promoting property management as either a side hustle or as a, just like in your case, you're talking about building it to an actual like big business that yeah. could one day be sold and yeah. you know, all of that, which it absolutely can be, you know, PE firms love recurring revenue. Yeah. Um, that's funny you brought that up because I was throwing an event, you know, kind of inspired by you. You, you mentioned like you should become known in your city first. So I've been spending a lot of time in San Diego throwing our Margarita and Mingle event. This guy comes up to me and he says, Hey, I work for, I can't say the property management company, but I work for this property management company. He's like, they need, he's looking to sell. They're an old company. They're still using receipts. So I wish <laughs> dude, like handwritten receipts. So I reached out to this guy because I used to fix his iPhone back in like 2012 when I had that <laughs> kid you not. He responds back to me and he's like, yeah, I'm actually, you know, I'm in my 60s now. I'm thinking about retiring. This is one of the biggest management companies in San Diego. He's like, it's probably going to be around $6 million is what the valuation is. They're putting up some numbers and it's all coastal stuff. So I got excited. And, you know, if I can sell off some properties, raise some funds and acquire this management company, not only do I get the income, the employees, the infrastructure, I can go in there and clean it up, but I also get access to those investors. So if they, that investor who owns those Beach properties, everyone wants to sell. Who are they going to call? Not, they're not, you're now their guy. So it's it's like a loophole, like pay the money. Maybe he can finance it, sell their finance, work out a deal with him, pay him over five years. But you know. Yeah, I didn't even think about all of the upside. So you acquire them, yep. right? Obviously, the business itself is going to put up your numbers. Yep. You're going to improve it by adding tech and yeah. other processes, the, right? The hard copy receipts. Yeah, we're going to add a little bit of tech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at Folio. Yeah. And then... uh you know, now you, like you said, I didn't even think about this, but you now have the relationships with all of these owners mm -hmm. for either private money, for either you making a broker fee. Because yep. look, I ain't a fan of being a realtor, but when you're selling $10 million homes, adds up. <laughs> adds, adds up. <laughs> three, 300K, that works. Yeah, like 30 days of work is a nice little payday. Yeah. Yeah. So, dude, I love that. I'm actually interested in getting in on that deal. Let's go. Let's talk like, about it. I want to know what he's doing and how we could structure it with, you know, he's probably willing to sell her finance too. Yeah. He just wants a nice little drip. He probably wants some down and then a drip because he's 60 and, you know, he's going to live till 90 and whatever. All right. We'll call him after this. Yeah.
I'm dead I got, serious. I got his number. I know. I'm dead serious. Yeah. We'll okay. call him. There you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't. I can't not negotiate a deal <laughs> or an opportunity. So, anyways, no, I love it. That like literally, that's why I'm bringing all this up right now because like I think through it and I'm like, it is a great business. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we obviously we own hundreds of units, yeah. and so like some of our partners on those units, they have their own property management arm. So they themselves are the ones making that money that we would have paid somebody else anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't have a cut of it, but the operating partner does. And like, it's great for them. And yeah. they're doing a great job. Yeah. Like, they're performing. They're doing great. Um, and so it's a win-win all the way around. Like, they control getting the construction done. So they get paid as the contractor. They yeah. control getting, you know, them rented out. And they're doing great. You know, occupancy's 97 plus percent. That's great. So like, they're killing it. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hands off for you. You bought back your time. You yeah. You podcast. You could travel. Yep. Hang with your kids, yep. wife. So, yeah, I love it. So, okay. Maximizing rents is one thing. Um, another thing is expenses. So let's talk about, you know, clearly like with NOI, there's two ways to increase it. You either get more revenue somehow <clears throat> or you decrease your expenses somehow, mm -hmm. right? So we just talked about occupancy and rent rates, but let's just talk about like overall maintenance and bull crap that people don't really yeah. see. Yeah. Like Grant Cardone, you know, I was in his real estate club and the, the two biggest expenses that people don't talk about or brokers try and leave off pro formas are taxes and insurance. Insurance is tough. you know. Bro, you our know. insurance across these big multifamily has like tripled. Yeah. yeah. That, that kills you. It kills you because we just talked about the formula. And so yeah. when insurance is, is boosted like that, like what do you do? Well, the best thing you do is increase income and then find other places to reduce expenses, whether that be through your manager. You know, maybe your manager doesn't deserve 10% and they don't earn that. Maybe they should be paying 6%. That that could add up. That could be a way to cut your expenses. Um, I haven't think thought of any brilliant ways to cut expenses except for having an asset. I actually operate as more of like an asset manager on the property manager. My property manager, she does the day-to-day and then I go to her and I say, hey, my investors and I on this property, you know, this is what we're trying to hit. So as an asset manager, that's something that, you know, I'm managing the property manager to yeah. do her job to cut expenses. But it's hard to find those expenses. You know, one thing people could do, though, is it's called rubs. It's a way to um, build back the utilities to the tenants. So maybe I'm setting up Internet for them and water and trash and electricity, and they're paying a flat fee. And then for that service of me prepaying it, I'm charging, you know, a premium of 50 bucks per 50, you know, across yeah. the units. That's the way to increase income right there. Yeah. Valet trash is another one. Maybe we don't want in our big multifamily buildings, these tenants dragging trash and everything across the property. Okay, we'll come pick up your prop for your trash for you. Yeah. Pet income is another way. Um, parking is big in North Park in San Diego. If you can provide parking, that's another way to bump income. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So de decreasing expenses is really like a lot harder than increasing income. Yeah. I'd be focused on the income. I think that's, that's probably how you would see it too. Like in any of your businesses, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't think about, I, I, I'm always like, bro, I, like we have a, we have a problem. Well, let's make more money. Yeah. We have an income problem, not an expense problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the opposite of the Dave Ramsey approach. Yeah. But, but you know, like at the end of the day, both are necessary. You know, every quarter is when I reevaluate all my expenses in business. And I'm like, all right, what are we spending money on that doesn't yeah. make sense? Whether it's salaries, whether it's marketing, whether it's, you know, a, a business just decision. And so, um, yeah, I, it's both, but income is the one that can always grow. Mm -hmm. you, you can't cut to like zero is what you can cut to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, if you cut your expenses to zero on a apartment building, I don't think you're going to have anything. Yeah, it could burn down and then you get the insurance. <laughs> That's the only you, way yeah. you have zero. Well, yeah. actually, you still have taxes and insurance. So it doesn't even matter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's say, um, you know, for those who are trying to become property managers, like what are some steps you got to do? Um, you know, to to manage other people's properties, you need to have a broker's license or operate underneath a broker. Um, at least in the state of California. I believe that to be true across the U.S. So, in most places, yeah. Yeah, so you definitely want to get a broker's license. But if you're just trying to learn the game and maybe lease properties, which is how I started off. I started off as a salesperson, and I learned how to lease these properties, what to say, you know, how to make it look bright in here, what, you know, how to walk them through. And so I think a lot of 
anything, and especially real estate, is a sales game. Selling an investor on why they should do a deal with you. Selling a property manager or a tenant on why they should lease with you. So I yeah. think it's just learning the sales game. And you know, there's books for that. Seller Be Sold by Grant Cardone is a good one to start with. Yeah. What uh, What's a typical property manager get paid? How do they get paid? Yeah. So we charge anywhere from 6 to 7%. Early on, we were doing six or seven percent, and then a one percent leasing fee on gross rents. Um, so total seven to eight percent. I've seen companies go upwards as ten percent, and you're going to need errors and omissions. You're going to need you know certain types of insurances. Uh, anywhere from six to ten percent is what I've seen. Okay, and I, I think it just depends on the value you're bringing. If I'm filing, you know, all the paperwork, doing the account, the accounting is huge on this. Yeah. These people always are always re investors are always refinancing. They need loans. So like getting them the paperwork um, is a big part of the job. Mm. So if you're managing a hundred grand worth of rents a month, you know, you're going to make six to 10 grand a month. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think we're at like 150,000 in rents per month. Uh, we are pulling in, I think it's like 10,000 right now, but we just had this crazy bump in rents for our student housing portfolio. So my property manager said we'll be pulling in about 15,000 per month on um, on the portfolio. So it varies. Some properties are five, some are 10. Yeah. Kind of hit or miss. How much time a, a week, you know, does it take you? Uh, up to now, zero. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'm going to become very vocal about this using social media and influence to reach new investors, yeah. specifically in San Diego. Yeah. Um, because we just know it well. And maybe we expand down the road or we, you know, buy a company elsewhere. But it, it's going to take more because I want to become a great just fiduciary to the investors. And what that means is my accounting game personally needs to be stepped up. I need to understand cash flow statements, profit loss, and everything very well. Because that's all the investors want. They're all numbers guys. Yeah. Yeah. And it's for you, I mean, it's like if you just get a couple of big investors who bring over, you know, hundreds of units, like yeah. that already changes the game right there. Yeah, my buddy went from 200 to 400 uh, because he brought on one of our buddy's portfolios. And this is his day job now. He quit his lending job. Big real estate investor in town, one of my best friends. I'm just following in his footsteps, learning from people who are already doing it. Yeah, because uh, like I just think about it. It's like, all right, if you're already at 15K a month, uh you could get to a hundred K a month pretty quickly. Yeah. Cause you, you don't have to actually buy the units and do those things that we, we have to do as real estate investors. Yeah. It's a lot harder. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I learned this from you. It's for a long time, you know, I'm the cell phone repair guy. I'm fixing the phone. I'm answering the calls. I'm doing everything as a solopreneur, but we went golfing two years ago and you told me like, you got to like bring people on. And I think I'm seeing this as actual business now, not as me running, the show, I can be the loudmouth on social and promote, 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 but I want my people running the business so that I could go on a mission trip to Belize or yeah. go to, you know, go travel and, and Cancun and all the things, Cabo. And so just uh, creating an almost lifestyle business, a real business that if I left and I came back, like we're still putting up numbers every month. We're still making money. Yeah. You're not expanding. worried about putting out every fire. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tired of that. Yeah. I'm with you on that. So, yeah, to like even take a step back, right? You know, you're talking about fixing cell phones and all this stuff. So like most people don't know, but like what were you doing before? Yeah, 2011 to 2021, cell phone repair company, iGeek Cell Phone, on campus at San Diego State in Pacific Beach and out front of the IKEA. So, so you, ran, you, you yourself weren't just like some guy on Craigslist fixing up phones. You had like storefront. I was legitimate. Yeah. Yeah, I was fixing a lot of phones. I mean, some days I would fix 10, 20 phones, 100 a pop. 2000 in income. There's no expenses. The expenses are very low for those screens for us. You just switched the screen out. Yeah, and like took me three minutes. I told, the <laughs> I told the people, come back in 15 minutes, it'll be done. It was done in like three minutes. But a value and perception. Yeah. But we did a great job. But that's just the market rate to fix the screen. Yeah. <laughs> and if you go on Yelp, we had a lot, like 400 five-star reviews. That's where I learned the customer service game because these college students will come into my store Sorority girls specifically. <laughs> Always breaking their phones. <laughs> Always breaking their phones. Crying and mad at me, like, because they broke their phone. <laughs> it's just bad. And I learned how to just have empathy, how to deal with them, how to <laughs> how to fix their phone and send them on their way. And they always left happy. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. So you did this business for 10 years. Like, 10 years. How much money were you making? Like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I would make a lot of money. 
Some days I'd have thousand dollar days. You know, I took all that money and I was following. Um, I actually think I was following Dave Ramsey first. Okay. And I was, that's how I got in. And then Robert Kiyosaki, but somehow Grant like popped up on my screen one day. I was like, I don't do what that guy's doing. I think he was hanging out on his jet or something. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> Dave yeah, Ramsey's not on his jet. He's not on his jet. I don't want to do that. So uh, I was like, I want to get into real estate, and I start putting money to the side, kind of like you. Similar story. I saved up twenty thousand um, cash in a bank. Uh, 2015, and then the other 20,000 I took as a line of credit against the business. Oh, wow. And I was nervous because every day they would take out $137 Monday through Friday out of my business account until I paid back the loan, the other 19,000. So I had to work harder, caused me to work harder, market more, do more deals. Took that 40K, 20 on the credit line, 20 cash, and I bought my first deal. That's how I got into real estate in 2016. And what was the deal? Uh, 6105 Dorothy, we paid $630,000. We put 120 K down between three investors, 40 K each. Um, and we rented it out, you know, it was like five or six K in rent to college students across the street from San Diego state, my alma mater. I was the manager, Matt got the loan and Kevin was the lawyer buddy of ours. And he, no, Kevin got the loan. Matt was the know-how. Matt's been a mentor of mine. And so we added an ADU deal, uh, ADU property or to that same parcel, and rent, we took rents from six thousand to about I think when we exited like eleven thousand in rents, we were able to enter on comps and then exit on a cap rate of like a five cap. We sold it for one point six, got a check for like over eight hundred k between the three of us. That was my yeah. first big payday. How long did like when did you sell it? Five years. So you bought it. You never like you weren't flipping. You you bought it with the intent for long Cash term. Flow. Yep. Cash flow was good. It was like a thousand a month. Yeah. It was decent. I paid my get, rent. You guys were all splitting it. Yeah. And then five years later, market goes up. You sell it. Yeah. You each make a couple hundred thousand bucks. Yeah. So I did that once, but I did that many, many, many times afterwards. Yeah. All in the same area, zip code, 92115. A lot of those comps are mine. You'll see them sold 161718. Now the problem is we can't buy them for 550 or 650 or 800 was still good. Cost a million bucks to buy these same homes now. The owners, older owners, tired owners have become more aware of what they have, and you just can't get that deal anymore. Right. Yeah. So you started doing this while you were doing the cell phone thing. You did the cell phone thing still till like 2021. Mm -hmm. So like what um, what caused you to stop doing the cell phone thing? How did that play out? Um, I did not want to let go of that business, but it's 2020. COVID hit. They're telling me to shut down the business because it was on campus at San Diego State. I'm like, no, nah, I'm still going to fix phones. So, <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, that's good. I'm in there fixing phones. Like, there's no one on campus. People are still breaking phones. No one, like, you can't even tell I'm open. It's kind of like this undercover, like, what's the... Were you like a kiosk or were you... <laughs> this is like a storefront. Did you even need a storefront? No, I didn't, but it was on campus. Like, it's like a small yeah. operation, yeah. The PB was an office. That was the... Pacific Beach was the an office and it was like small like 200 square feet right the kiosk and pb again small but the san diego state store because of the great location on campus i had to pay for a storefront there what was your rent i think it was like 2200 that's still cheap i See, feel like it seemed like a lot back then though for me back then yeah. it did now no yeah like to be on the college campus selling them on something it. they need all the freshmen walking over the bridge would see my store big lit sign it was great yeah that seems like a great deal yeah I was cranking. But what happened was Aztec shops, real big real estate people, uh, they said we're going to put, because of COVID and packaging and boxes, they thought COVID was on the boxes and they didn't want to like. They thought COVID was on the boxes. <laughs> <It> <laughs> no, I remember yeah. that. That's why I'm dying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't just drop packages off and they needed to go to this like location, AKA a UPS or USPS, whatever. And so USPS ended up taking my space. I got the boot. I was mad. I was at the crossroads. I was like, this is messed up. How are you guys going to do this to me? Uh, Your lease was up or they forced you out? I think they like bought me out or forced me out. It was November 2021 or 2022. Got it. And at that point, I was like, well, I got to go all in on this real estate thing or I'm going to I'm gonna end up moving back home to Sacramento. So mm. I went all in. <laughs> like I ain't trying to go to NorCal again. I'm not trying to go back to NorCal. I'll go visit. I ain't going back. Yeah. So you... Okay, so you you had been buying real estate though for like while you were you're just taking your money from cell phones and buying yeah. more real estate. Yeah. So by that time, like what how, what had you done in real estate at that point? Let's see. So that was around when we started to meet. Yeah, 2022. We we had met a lot of what. So I bought two homes in 2016, and then I was broke. I had no money. 
I had an income problem. I wasn't making enough cash. I barely and got you threw into every it. dollar you had into yeah. real estate. On the first one, yes. The second one, I had zero in. I just found the deal right up the street. And uh, Kevin's dad put up all the money, and then we paid him back when we refinanced and built the ADU. So two deals in 2016, 17, 18, 19, quiet. Crickets for me because I'm struggling because all my money went into that. And I probably, you know, I was still going out, partying. And <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't a good saver. No, I wasn't a good saver. You know, I was just blowing my money like a like a 20-year-old would. Uh, I don't regret it. It was great. So 2019, I get my salesperson license and I start making these fat commissions like 20000 12000 because 2.5% on a $800,000 home. Yeah. So it was between 2019, really the end of it, and then 2020 when COVID hit, all these older people in the 92115 zip code uh, decided to start selling their homes because the older community didn't want to be around the San Diego State College students. They're going to get the COVID. The COVID. So they're like, <laughs> we're, we're out of here. Yeah. So I swooped up all these homes. I'm talking like a house a month. Mm. And I'm raising capital. I'm moving things. I'm stressed. I'm in one man shop. I got 15 investors, but I'm getting like 50% equity on all these deals. And that's when I just by it. you. So you got 50% equity by finding the deal, raising the money. You're like, I'll do it all. Here's the deal. You put up the money and we'll chop. Exactly. Just like at WealthCon, um, Brandon Turner said, he, yeah. he he said he would get 50% of his deals and he would do all the work. And it's harder for me to get that now because I think people see a certain level of success and they're like, no, you got to put in money too. Because I don't get that as much anymore. But if the deal's good enough, maybe I can negotiate it. Um, but yeah, that's that's where I built a lot. It was like 2020, 2022, right before we met. Mm. So you built up this portfolio. Yeah. And then um, you go full time in real estate. Yeah. And real estate investors, are you tired of getting low quality leads and talking with sellers who've been hit up by everyone else? Well, what if you could get inbound leads of motivated sellers on autopilot without any effort? Well, that's exactly what we do at Lead Kitchen. Over the years, I spent millions of dollars on direct to seller marketing. I've done PPC, I've done TV commercials, I've done cold calling, text messaging, direct mail, I've done the pay per lead services. And look, all of them can work. A lot of them don't. At the end of the day, I have found a new method that is getting me better results than I've ever seen in my career. I'm getting lower cost per leads than ever before, and it's not just in Las Vegas, it's across the country. And so if you wanna take advantage of this new innovative marketing strategy that takes no effort on your end, I want you to go to leadkitchen.com and book a call with my team today. Imagine having my team running your marketing with the same leads that I'm getting in my business. That's what you can have. So just go to leadkitchen.com today and book a call. I remember when we met, you were talking a lot about ADUs. So like, how did ADUs start to become a, a thing for you? Um, You know, ADUs is... And by the way, a lot of people don't even know what an ADU is, yeah. so explain that. Yeah, so an ADU is an accessory dwelling unit. You essentially think of it like a granny flat. You know, if your mom and dad own a home and grandma's getting a little older and they want her to live on that parcel, they'll put her in the casita, the, the home in the back. So California and a lot of other cities, Austin, Cincinnati, Miami, people allow, or the uh, government allows you to build this unit in your backyard by right is what they call it. Meaning you could build it no matter what. As long as you stay within certain parameters, setbacks, you're good to go. And uh, California could build up to 1,200 square feet, which is amazing. The full house. A full house. Uh, for, for us, student housing, it's actually a four-bed, two-bath. So I'm getting like 6 k on some of these properties, and it cost me 250 to build. It's, wow. Now, what's amazing about San Diego is it's the best ADU Ford city in the world. And what I mean by that is I can not only build one ADU, I could build four, I could build 10, I could build 20, if it's the correct zoning, which that's what we teach at our backyard community for our local developers in San Diego. So You could build 20 ADUs yeah. if it has the right zoning. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, are you, you, I mean, clearly there would have to be a lot of land. Some of these lots would be about 7,000 square feet, and we build up three to four stories. Oh, you can build... Vertically, it's basically multifamily development using the ADU code by right. It's whoa, insane. I did not. Okay, when you were describing that, I was like, okay, so like you need like freaking acres, 15,000 square foot lots. Yeah, 15,000. No, that's not even that's well, a yeah. third of an acre. Yeah. I'm, I'm like thinking you need, but do you're just talking about building normal multifamily, exactly. So, but and it's by right, meaning the community. Um, they call them NIMBYs, not in my backyard. Like they can't say, they can't, pro they could protest against it, but they can't stop it because it's by right. It's 
local. They call them NIMBYs. NIMBYs, yeah, not in my backyard. That's a, there's signs like all over San Diego that say like you know no to development. But this is how I see it. We're solving a problem. <laughs> it reminds me of like uh, I don't even know why, but like Harry Potter, these Muggles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So you have the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. You have Camp Pendleton. You have Tijuana. You have the mountains. There's nowhere for the San Diegans to live, and that's why rents just keep going up, and we're becoming a renters nation. Now, people like me are solving a problem. We provide nice, clean housing in great locations. Brand new. Yeah, and we get paid to do that, and um, I don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah, I I mean, I don't either. I mean, at the end of the day, like, I understand why people get mad at Airbnb. That I understand because I'm like, yeah, it's new people coming in and out, partying. But, like, if you're going to go build, you know, a multifamily ADU, yeah, and then, you know, people are staying there for 12 months, like, it's like... Who gives a crap? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, that's something we utilize. Uh, if it wasn't a six, seven thousand square foot multifamily zone lot, we would look for a bigger lot, maybe ten to fifteen thousand square feet, and we would build maybe six ADUs, kind of these little clusters. And you're keeping the original house. Yes. So you, you're gonna buy. Okay, explain to me like what a deal would look like. You're analyzing a deal. Okay. So what are these typical houses and properties like? How big is the house? What are you paying? How big is the lot? I could talk about a deal that I have right now. Okay, um, let's talk about 12, it. 12,000 square foot lot. You know, it was a sober facility for a while. They didn't want to move out. Finally, they said, hey, it's time for us to move out of here. I said, okay, that's cool. We're remodeling it right now. I finish in the next few days. Student housing, I think it's like a seven bed. I'm getting 9,000 in rent on that alone to students. Same this is that day. just the current house? Current house, 9,000. Starting July 1. How much or how big is it? Uh, 2,200 square feet. How many bedrooms? It's like eight bedrooms or seven bedrooms, four baths. How are they putting eight bedrooms in 2,200 square feet? It works. The students, because the <laughs> students are coming from the dorms, they're happy to just have a place to call home as opposed to this apartment complex or the small, tiny dorms. Yeah. I, so room, literally the whole house is just friggin' eight by 10 bedrooms. There's four bathrooms and then like a living room and then outdoor space. We do fake grass. We're not lo- like slumlords. The, the rooms are maybe, you know, 120 square feet. They're not huge, but yeah. they work. I would live there. Yeah. They, they clearly pay. I mean, they're like a dorm. It, it really a dorm. is a dorm. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, the student housing game. Pacific Beach, st- typical. Two bed, one baths. Um, but on that Montezuma deal, we are going to build, I'm going to build because I'm 100% of that deal. Uh, essentially, that parcel becomes 25 bedrooms. Um, across six different ADUs, little clusters. And it's a bigger square lot. Um, construction on it's around 700K. Plans and permits about 80,000. My holding costs, let's just call it 100K. Um, property value when it's done, it's got to be north of six or seven million. And you'll be all in for what? I'll be all in for, I overpaid on that one, I would say. Uh, I paid 1.8, but I put down a million bucks. So my loan on it's low. It's 800,000 currently. So you bought it for 1.8. You yep. got a million in expenses? Uh, 700, yeah. 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 So 2.8, 2. you think it'll be worth 6 million plus? For sure. hundred percent. Student housing, cross street from San Diego State. Montezuma Road is the main artery. In and and they're valuing that based on cap rate. They're able to do it on cap rate because of the student housing play. Um, a new investor, maybe a doctor or chiropractor, he's going to come in there. He's going to look at the property and say, you know, I'm ba- buying this at a five cap because it's stabilized, brand new, fake grass. New construction. And I get to keep management if I ever sell it. But this is the type of property where I keep it forever, you know, Cash flow is 30000 per month because I'm going to try and finance construction with cash. And then this type of property, when I'm done, I can retire or spend more time doing what I love, which is creating content, traveling, more of a lifestyle business. Got it. So you said that you're going to have like six different clusters of AD. Like, what do you mean? Because to me, a 15,000 square foot lot is still nothing. Mm-hmm. Like half an acre is like 20,000 square feet, basically. Yeah. So the clusters, um, you know, it what it looks like is the 1,200 square foot ADUs that people see in their backyards is kind of two story rectangular boxes. So it's a 600 square foot plate box. On the bottom, yeah, and then okay. 600 on the second story because we do two stories. Yep. Okay. And I'm gonna do six of those where the architect can fit them. And um, so it's gonna be legit six different properties. Yeah. Let me count this one. There's a house. One, two, three, four, five. 
Yeah, I think it's actually seven, actually. Seven total. Six ADUs plus the house. So seven. And the sh- reason you're not going even more vertical is because the zoning doesn't allow it? See, that property is a single family, so it's RS17, meaning I could only go two stories. Now, what I told you earlier with the 7,000 square foot lots with like the 20 units, that's RM3738 or 39. That's the magic. If you can get that, it's zone multifamily. There you can go three, four, five stories. So you don't need a bigger lot. It almost becomes like this nice big rectangular box uh, asset that would trade very well in the after, you know, when you stabilize it. So, so, but you are basically building to its max capability. Exactly. We're maxing it out. Yeah. Based on the floor area ratio and the lot size. Right. Yeah. Because if you had one of those other ones, you're, you're for sure building five stories or whatever they'll allow oh, you yeah. to build. Yeah, exactly. And we don't, we won't go four or five stories cause then you'll need elevators. Construction goes up much more concrete. Um, I like to stay in the kind of three-story realm where if you're at three stories, you don't need construction. I'm sorry, you don't need a, an elevator, which yeah. saves you a million bucks alone. Wow. And you can get a little more parking um, sometimes if you go three stories. So, Oh, yeah, yeah I forgot about parking. That's the tough part. Yeah. How, how, how are they parking in neighborhoods? Like you can't have 25 cars. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. So the good news is San Diego State, my property is across the street from a um, – up the street from a parking garage, but also a lot of students are okay with no cars. They're just walking. Yeah, yeah they're walking. Now, where it's a problem is in North Park in San Diego. People are overdeveloping it on some properties there. They're building seven stories, uh, no parking. It's a it's a headache. I, I wouldn't do that. But in PB, people are willing to not have parking because you're by the beach. So that's where I would do these kind of three-story plays that we're actively doing. They don't have any parking like... Because, you know, like whenever you're building commercial and stuff, there's always a parking ratio that you must have mm-hmm. in most things, but apparently not here. <laughs> it goes, Yeah, it goes away with the ADU code because yeah. they just want to provide more housing. And San Diego, for some reason, thinks people are going to get rid of their cars. It ain't happening, you know? Like people, <laughs> people are paying premium for our units like they want a parking spot. So we try and provide at least one parking spot uh, for every two properties, not every – um, for every two units. Not every unit's going to get a spot in, in our Yes. Yeah. This is a side note. This has nothing to do with it. But, yeah. like, I, um, I I actually do think cars will go away one day. Mm-hmm. I don't know when. Um, as far as people, like, owning them. Yeah. And people will always be able to own them. But I think they'll be more like a... Um, to delicacy. Yeah. You know, like, I, I just think that cars will drive themselves and... Mm-hmm. Uber and Turo, or not Turo, but Uber and all the Waymo, everybody's just going to have an app. Cars yeah. will pick them up, AI, yeah. you know, robo-taxi, take them to spots for, like, nothing because they don't have to pay drivers. Yeah. Like, that, in my mind, is going to happen. Like, even today, I actually was running the math, and I was like, dude, I would actually, it would be cheaper for me to Uber everywhere. Yeah. It would. <laughs> and I don't have to drive. <laughs> <I> wanna- <laughs> and, and, like, I can get more done. That's that's funny you bring that up. It's kind of like the Jetsons. So in 2017, my Audi S5 got hit, wrecked. And I was so sad about it. I was like, what is going on? At the time, I didn't have a good credit score. And I couldn't get a car. And I was a little bummed about it. So what did I do? I Ubered everywhere for a whole year. I spent like three, yeah, <laughs> to, to my business. But it was great because I sat in the back of the car. Got, I got work done. I got work done. I didn't have to think about anything. I just focused. Today, I made that same mistake flying from San Diego. Usually, I always Uber to the airport. Always. Today, I was like, oh, I'm going to drive since I'm flying back tonight. I got there, had to deal with parking, parked across the street. I was like, I should You still Uber. paid for parking, too. Yeah, yeah exactly. I got to update my parking right now. So, um, Ubering everywhere is kind of a nice thing. Yeah, because like basic math, I really don't drive much. I drive to the office and I drive home. Yeah. Like, there's not a ton I, I drive to. Um, not like driving to flips and all this crap. So I was doing the math. I was like, okay, five days a week, I go to the office, you know, say it's 20 bucks there, 20 bucks back. That's 40 bucks. Okay. 40 bucks times 20 is $800 a month. Yeah. Okay. Now, granted, even if I doubled that and said, I, I, I also went to other places. Yeah. That's 1600 a month. My car payments more than that. Yeah. And we're not even talking insurance. I don't have gas, I have Tesla, but like electricity, all the other crap, maintenance, devaluing, time I get back. And I'm like, huh, why do I drive? Yeah, insurance. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually way cheaper already for me to do this. Yeah. And then imagine when 
that actually becomes like five or ten dollars to do each way because it will. Yeah, it's going to get cheaper without drivers. Yeah, that'd be cool. Kind of mob around in one of those new. Uh, what is it? The new the new Tesla. The cyber? Oh, the cyber truck? Yeah. Yeah, I flipped one of those. You did? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see that. That's awesome. Yeah, I made some money. That's awesome. I'll flip anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what about this couch? No, that couch will be a, a big <laughs> negative for me. That was an expensive couch. That <laughs> I'll lose a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. But uh yeah, that's the future. The future is that like people that. won't have to drive. Yeah. And uh I mean it, it should be my future right now. The only reason it's not my future or current present is because uh I don't like people, I, I don't really let, Mindy doesn't want people picking me up and taking me home and knowing where we live and yeah, just being public. That makes sense. So that's the only reason I don't do it. Maybe just a, a Ryan Serhant private driver, back of a Tahoe type well, deal. Okay, for one, like now it's not cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it would definitely be a lot more now. Yeah. Um, but two, um, it's still not a bad idea, especially when you consider the time perspective. But like, you know, in Vegas, it's different than San Diego or Cali where, dude, you like your car trips are freaking forever. Yeah. So, dude, if you got 30 minutes, an hour back each day, in some cases, you might get two hours back a day Yeah. because of traffic. We we don't have that. It takes me 12 minutes to get here. Yeah. A lot of space out here. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense in New York, too, where there's no parking. Makes sense. Why oh, bro. Yeah. If I was in New York, there's no way I would drive. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing, though, about that. So, I mean, for you, man, being a hustler and an entrepreneur too, um, you know, I, I've just kind of watched your growth the last bunch of years. I mean, obviously, you've been a part of our different programs. You've been a WealthCon a bunch. We vacation together, golf together. Yep. So I've, I've just gotten to see you grow. And uh, one thing you've been growing in that I've seen is your faith, man. How's that journey been? Yeah, yeah it's been good. So a lot of people don't know this about me, but grew up uh, born and raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, kinder to 12th grade, sang in the choir. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, I did sing in the choir. It was, it was great. I love I was like, me and my brother were the only guys, and it was all girls. It was great. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I would say, like, what I find at my church, Awaken in San Diego, with a lot of common denominator between the guys is, yeah, we grew up Catholic. You go to college. You kind of lose touch with your faith. Maybe you go down these, these paths that aren't, you know, aligning with God's purpose for me. And uh, that happened to me in my 20s for, for a while. And I was feeling lost, turning to, to alcohol, drugs, and just not focused on like my purpose. It wasn't until maybe my late 20s I started to feel like, like this kind of emptiness in me. Um, tried to stop drinking multiple times, didn't work, always you know, relapsed or went back to it. And um, you know, I turned to maybe training, Ironmans, trying to just like find something to like latch onto so I could fill this kind of void I was missing. And, um, you know, over the last maybe year and a half or so, I was invited to a Christian church, which I didn't even know the difference between. Them. I'm like, what? My, my buddy yeah. Liam, he, uh, he was helping me with sales. He's like, yeah, hey, come to church with me. I was like, all right, let's do it. That sounds great. I saw something in his eyes when we sat down, which I found out was like the Holy Spirit in him. He was yeah. just like a solid, like, I don't know. We really connected. And he was tracking me down. So it's kind of cool to see how God was pursuing me through him. Yeah. And I was like too busy or not too cool, but just too busy, not making time for him. Who is this guy? We sat at a Starbucks. He invited me to church. Uh, went to the Christian church for the first time. We're, we're worshiping and singing. I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. <laughs> we don't do this in Catholic yeah, church. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, this is kind of cool. <laughs> and, you know, I, I I created, like I have an actual relationship with the Lord now, which I'm proud about. I start the day. Um, in the word today, I was kind of in a hurry and I didn't have time. So I took a photo of it on my phone. I read it on the plane. Yeah. Um, been doing a lot of men's prayer and in general, I just feel a lot better about myself. Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't need to turn to alcohol. God's like giving me the word to like stop drinking. So it's been 10 months. I'm feeling better than ever. Yeah. And, uh, now I feel like I can go and actually help people. Yeah. How much like more clear is your mind? So clear. Yeah. Like sitting here with you, I don't feel nervous. I feel like very present. I'm here. And and that's all because God is like, I feel like maybe cleansed me of any shame or, um, you know, anxiousness. It's just like, like help purify my heart a little bit. I think he's he's still actively working on my heart. I still yeah. have my moments. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. We like, always do. Yeah. I'm like this business owner, like go A-type, like very similar to you. So it's, sometimes it's hard for me to 
go from that in the work field where I have all these attacks on me through different investors and all this stuff, right? Stuff comes up and then go back to my personal life and personal relationships and like shut that down. Yeah. That's something I'm working on. Yeah. 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 I always tell people, man, it's, it's hard. Um, first off, <laughs> we live in a fallen world. Mm -hmm. So like, it's always going to be problem after problem after yeah. problem. And that's why I tell people, cause it's like, I just had a conversation with one of my sales guys and he's always kind of like up and down. Mm. Right. And he's a believer. And I'm like, dude, why are you so up and down all the time? Yeah. It's like you let problems dictate your attitude mm. so much. And, uh, you know, we had a long conversation and I was like, bro, like, you know, we got like a strong foundation, yeah. right? When you have a strong foundation, when you're built on a rock, yeah. rocks don't break, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to hit the rock a little bit. We're going to bounce back. We're going to mm -hmm. keep getting back up and keep moving forward. And, um, you know, I just kind of tell people that I'm like. Problems are still coming. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you you might have a lot even more, right? Like <laughs> yeah. the yeah. moment you start following God, you're not guaranteed to not have problems. You're guaranteed to have salvation mm -hmm. and to have peace even when you have problems. Yeah. Like that's the key is that Paul talks about, hey, dude, I rejoice no matter what kind of problems I'm having. I'm content in every circumstance. That is insane. You said that because today, yeah, I hadn't been in the word for the last two days. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I got to get back in the word. I took the photos. I'm reading it on the flight, and I'm in Corinthians too, and uh, talks about Paul. Paul's yeah. like rejoicing, even though he's in prison, right? Yep. He's still. It's an opportunity to share the word, and I was like, man, where did, where's that showing up in my life? Where like I feel like things aren't going my way right now. Relationships gone bad. Business deals gone sideways. But like I can still glorify Lord like in this moment in time. And when I get out of this, I can continue to glorify Lord, the Lord, and it could be cool for others as a testimony to see like where I was. And then, like, where I end up through all this. Yep. Yeah. A thousand percent. Yeah. I mean, Paul's in prison, you know, writing these different letters, man. And, you know, he's just like, guys, I'm content no matter what's going on. I rejoice no matter what's going on. Whether I'm being persecuted, whether things were good, it's all good. And, like, even for me, I've, I've always said throughout the last 18 months, just been transparent with everyone. of Like, hey, you know, I've had this problem and that problem. The real estate market has sucked. I lost millions doing this stupid thing and that thing and it's like despite that i have peace mm -hmm. my relationship with my wife has never been better my kids my faith has continued to grow you know financially sure took a step back with those things but it's also pruned me to get ready for this next stage yeah i love that and that's that's something that i feel has happened with me lately too is for a, the longest time i felt like this was my goal 100,000 per month in cash flow, whether it's through rentals. And, and I was so fixated on the goal that I lost touch with relationships with friends, family, and I was just so fixated on the goal. Now I, I take a step back and I'm like, no, I'm good with my slow, steady, consistent growth. I'm still going to be urgent in the way, you know, I'm making moves. Yeah, you want to improve. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not tied to the end goal. Like I know God has me on this path and sometimes I'm going to have some setbacks, but it, it, it gives me more peace. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because it's actually what you just described is what most Christians get wrong about the pursuit of money. And so, you know, a lot of Christians have a, a poverty mindset. And I don't think many watching this show do because clearly they, they would have stopped watching a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's, um, you know, a bunch of Christians who, who are like, well, you know, being rich is bad. And that's an extreme version. And they'll say, you know, hey, like the Bible says that you can't pursue both God and money, mm -hmm. right? You can only do one. Mm -hmm. And uh, really what that verse is saying is that your focus must be God. It cannot be money. Mm -hmm. So what you described was 100K. That's my focus. That's the goal. Everything else, I still have a life. Like I still have relationships. I still... You know, like I, I want to please God and everything, but the hundred K is the goal, mm -hmm. right? That's when it becomes the problem. That's yeah. when we're seeking money and wealth and fame, whatever those things are, right? Followers. It can be anything. Yeah. But you know, in Matthew six thirty three, we talk about seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what the approach is supposed to be. Hey, if I just seek God first and I seek righteousness and I seek his kingdom, all the rest, according to that verse, will be added to me. Now, 
what that looks like is going to be different for everyone. But I know if I just seek that first, all the other stuff, whatever happens, happens. I'm good with it either way. <laughs> Whether yeah. I become a millionaire or a deca millionaire or a hundred millionaire or yeah. a billion, I really don't care. None of it is the goal. Mm -hmm. The goal is just to seek him first. And whatever happens from that, I'm good with. Yeah, and I think you did a video or reel about this recently. Maybe I just saw it. Like it's the point of getting baptized and committing your life to the Lord is for eternal life. Yeah. It's not for these worldly things such as money or idolizing money, which a lot of people do, specifically maybe real estate investors because, you know, everyone's always chasing that next deal. Yeah. That's something I struggled with for a while. It's like always needing that next deal, not being able to say no, like I don't need that risk. And Yeah, and I think there's nothing, by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting the next deal mm -hmm. or wanting to build your business or grow your business. So for any Christians listening, I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying. God calls us to steward whatever we have been given mm -hmm. with excellence. Yeah. So if you've been given a business and employees and wealth and rentals and whatever else, you should be a great fiduciary, like you mentioned before, of what you've been given. Mm -hmm. That's good. And so he doesn't say, hey, just like ignore it all and just like, you know, go be a monk yeah. and like do that. That's not what he says. He <laughs> says, be a good steward of whatever you've been given. Mm -hmm. And so being a good steward is making things better, yeah. constantly improving, you know, getting a return. Like literally the parable of the talents is about getting a return yeah. on what God has given you. So clearly we are to steward and get returns. Yeah. The problem is, like I said, where we lose sight of what the real goal is. Mm -hmm. And so like the purpose of that reel you're talking about is like, the real goal is eternity. Yeah. The real goal is saving souls. Mm -hmm. This other stuff is important, but it's not the real goal. And so the moment this becomes more important to me than the real goal, that's when I know I've lost myself. Yeah. That's good, man. Yeah. And, you know, I just think uh, now you're seeing that, right? Because you know, I already know anyone in real estate the last couple of years has had a rough go of it, oh, you know, yeah. like you mentioned, right? Yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, if your identity is wrapped up in your deals or how many assets you have or in the whatever, right? Like you're going to feel bad about yourself when the market's bad and you'll feel good about yourself when the market's good and mm -hmm. whatever else, right? And it's like, no, dude, we got to get away from that mindset and realize that like our identity is not wrapped up in that. Our identity is in Christ, mm -hmm. and regardless of anything else happening, it doesn't matter yeah. because that's where my identity is. That's why when anyone wants to say some crap about me or whatever else, I'm just like, whatever. Yeah, which I'm going to end up asking you about on my podcast because <laughs> I just, I'm, I, I'm starting to get some hate on my comments, and it's funny to me. I like laugh about it. I'm just like, yeah, oh, that's okay. Maybe I'm doing something right because you know the hate's coming. Yeah. The attacks are coming. Yeah. How do you deal with it currently? Currently... I think in the past, I know what I would have done. I probably would have said something back, not in a complete direct rude way, but kind of condescending. Now I'm just like, oh man, they're probably just having a bad day or they, they see something in me they like that they don't have. Like, I'm gonna pray for them maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Pray for them that maybe maybe I can help them. Maybe I can convert them and and show them something they're missing to, yeah. help, to help them a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's obviously the right mindset. Yeah. And it's tough. It's tough because your flesh wants to go beat the crap out of them, and then your <laughs> your spirit's like, "Nah, dude, chill out." Like, yeah. remember how far you've come. Yeah, exactly. you were that guy. Yeah, yeah, that that could have been me back in the day. Yeah, yeah, maybe a little jealous of someone who had more success. Hundred percent. Yeah. So, well, bro, I'm proud of you. Where everything's going. Hey, so if somebody uh, is in San Diego or they want to invest with you on some ADUs or learn about ADUs or even have their properties managed, where they find you? Yeah. So uh, Instagram's easiest. I'm very active. What's I'm your handle? Chris J. Luna. Chris J. Luna. Uh, also, backyardbillionaire.com is our landing page for the education company. Um, that's where they can find us. We're launching a new website for the property management company, but nice. they just reach out to me on Instagram. We have our link trees there to get them to the right department in which they need to, you know, whether that's raising capital and doing deals together, education and or property management, uh, vertically integrated in San Diego is what we do. Yeah, I think those uh, ADU deals are really cool. Yeah a great opportunity yeah it's it's cool to get into multifamily development and you don't have to raise too much money you get to keep a lot of the equity um because the deals aren't these big skyscrapers this is just a deal in our backyard and that's why we call the community the backyard community 
because in my opinion- You're literally building multifamily in people's backyards. Yeah, that, but also from a bigger standpoint, I say start in your backyard. I, we're going to tie this back around. I say I tell people, start in your backyard. What that, What does that mean? Like, yes, you can build in your backyard, but also if you're in Vegas or you're in Miami, start in your city, in your backyard, buy real estate there because then you can manage it and you can cut the expenses, increase the income, yeah. which bumps the NOI, which increases the value. When you can see and touch that property, you're just going to have more success. You're going to be proud of it. You can take photos in front of it. It's just going to lead to more success. Yeah. I tell that to people all the time. They're yeah. like, dude, I live in California. I can't afford anything out here. I got to invest somewhere else. I'm like, no, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> like, Anyone can invest in their backyard yeah. right now. Like yeah. That's where I would always recommend starting out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've been in the game for eight years, and I'm just now looking into different markets because I think that as my social media grows, my ability to raise capital grows, my problem will then become I need bigger assets so that I can throw LP money into a fund and then operate as a GP and change yeah. the business model. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, dude. Well, guys, go check out Chris over on IG. We'll link to it down below, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Peace.